we are now live on YouTube. Okay, I think we're good to start. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Basma Bassi, and I'm an advocacy assistant at the European Center for Democracy and Human Rights. As you may know, ECDHR is an NGO coalition promoting human rights and democracy in the Arabian Peninsula. So today, along with my colleague Alina Karastamatova, we would like to welcome you all to this interactive virtual panel titled EU Magnitsky Sanctions, which will launch ECDHR's legal campaign against perpetrators in Bahrain. I invite our audience to have a look at our website and our GoFundMe page to see how you may support this campaign. Both links will follow shortly in the chat box. I will now give the floor to my colleague Alina who will introduce the topic in a little bit more detail as well as the panelists. Thank you very much, Basma. A very good afternoon, everyone. It's so wonderful you managed to join us today. Uh, now moving along to our event itself, it will focus on the new EU global human rights sanctions regime, as well as its applicability to Bahrain. Our panel will review the operation of this sanction regime and also whether the current climate of political and religious repression in Bahrain calls for international response from the European Union and other international actors. We are so excited to welcome our impressive panel, which is composed of UK-based international barristers, Michael Pollack of Charge Four Chambers and Anahita Moradi of One Pound Court, a Bahrain political expert and author of Political Repression in Bahrain, Mark Owen Jones, and finally, a Bahrain political activist, Ali Mushaima, the son of imprisoned political opposition leader, Hassan Mushaima. Please feel free to write any questions in the chat box as our speakers begin their discussions and towards the end, we'll read your questions out loud. Uh, now I give the floor to Basma, who will present our first speaker. Thank you, Alina. So our first speaker is Anahita Moradi. She is a barrister at One Pump Court Chambers and her cases, cases predominantly concern countries in the Middle East and she covers a wide range of issues such as arbitrary detention abroad, enforced disappearances, torture, capital punishment and international sanctions. Today, Anahita will talk about the various human rights abuses predominant in Bahrain and she will introduce the sanction mechanism that we intend to pursue. I would like to give our audience a trigger warning as her speeches may contain some details on torture and it may cause distress to some. And without further ado, the floor is yours, Anahita. Thank you, Basma, and thank you everyone for joining. The Arab uprising in 2011 saw Bahrainis take to the streets. They demanded their basic democratic rights. What started off, though, with a peaceful gathering at the Pearl Roundabout in Bahrain ended with carnage on the part of the Bahraini government. This small kingdom is ruled by family, and this family wants to protect its power. So it will, as it did, crack down on dissent, and it uses its government to achieve this. The Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry Report, which we've looked at, reveals the tactics behind this crackdown in 2011. It found in its report that many people were seriously injured and even killed by the Bahraini government's use of excessive force to move people from the streets, for example, by shooting them, by beating them. And this led to Salmania Hospital, this is one of Bahrain's biggest main hospitals, being overrun with demonstrators presenting with very serious trauma injuries. But the government forbade uh, ambulances from attending to those injured and dying on the streets, those that couldn't make their way to Salmania. And any medics trying to circumvent this rule were themselves attacked. And after that, the government went ahead and banned all other gatherings. But the abuses didn't stop there. Demonstrators and even political leaders were and still are arrested and subjected to torture, arbitrary detention and due process interferences of which we'll hear more about. 
There are reports of detainees being subjected to physical torture, including, for example, uh, severe beatings, being sodomized with sharp objects and being electrocuted. But it doesn't stop there. Psychological torture is also commonplace with uses of threats of violence, incommunicado detention and solitary confinement, for example. One of the purposes of these forms of torture is to extract false confessions from political prisoners used to bolster the trumped up and politically motivated charges that they face, uh, such as, for example, instigating hatred against the ruling system or spreading false news. And there's evidence that after that, the trial processes of these political pro uh, prisoners that have been charged uh, with these, on these politically motivated offences contravene international law. For example, breaches of fair trial minimum standards, which include having a lawyer of your own choice, having access to that lawyer in a confidential environment, having adequate time and facilities to prepare your defence, and to challenge the evidence against you, either yourself or through your chosen lawyer. And what we've seen evidence of is these grossly unfair trials lead to unsafe convictions, which have also sometimes resulted in the imposition of the death penalty. Now, in the face of these brutalities, there has been what we've seen a total failure to investigate these torture and extrajudicial killing claims without delay, impartially and effectively. And it's this impunity of the state uh, officials that helps maintain the ruling family and its government's control over a people. They can do what they want, knowing that they won't face any consequences, not even a slap on the wrist. Just as an example, officials have been promoted to higher ranks after being involved in these abuses. Some have been acquitted. And at best, we've seen officials being charged with lesser offences, for example, manslaughter, not murder. So just wrapping up my part to seek accountability for all of these abuses, subject to resources, what we intend to do is seek sanctions against Bahraini, uh, the Bahraini government under the EU's relatively new global human rights sanctions regime. Sanctions under this regime can be sought for serious human rights violations or abuses. And those that pertain best to our case include torture, extrajudicial killings, arbitrary detentions, and also violations of the freedoms of peaceful assembly, opinion and expression. The targets can be government bodies or even individual officials. And the measures that would be imposed include bans on travel to the EU and financial restrictions. But I'm going to hand over now to Michael, who'll tell you more about the sanctions regime. Thank you. Thank you, Anahita, for the background on the various human rights violations that continue to take place in Bahrain and for introducing the legal strategy that a CDTR will take to end the culture of impunity in Bahrain. Now, uh, please welcome Michael Pollack, barrister practicing from Church Board Chambers in London, who specializes in the use of international law to counter impunity for international crimes, including sanctions, UN applications, private prosecutions, and human rights litigation, who will talk in more detail about ACDGR's legal strategy in the process of seeking sanctions at EU level, as well as the aim of the sanctions and the enforcement that should follow. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Alina. And Thank you so much for putting together today's conference. It's great to have such a uh, good panel. And Ahita set out uh, the um, what we're really looking at here with our project uh, perfectly. And I have to say, uh, it's great to have Mark Jones on the panel as well. Uh, he may be too modest uh, to push his book, but I've got a copy of it here. Um, you will see it here, Political Repression in Bahrain. It's a fantastic book. And it actually has a section uh, within it 
uh, in regards to how uh, the Bahraini regime uses sanctions and rewards to control or attempt to control people in Bahrain, which I thought was quite interesting in the context of what we're talking about uh, today. We hope that you can spread the word about this project uh, and, uh, and that you will um, uh, help us to uh, push out the news about what we're doing, the crowdfunding which is needed to get this project off the ground as well. Uh, and uh, it's great to have you with us. I'm a barrister and I specialize in looking at ways at preventing impunity, whether that's private prosecutions and complaints under universal jurisdictions uh, provisions. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've got one of those underway at the moment, international applications to the United Nations uh, and any form of, of using the law to combat impunity. Impunity is something that we have a huge problem with in Bahrain, where the Bahraini people uh, are subject to systematic repression and have been for some time. The new sanction regimes in the EU and the UK are brilliant opportunities to address impunity. And credit should go to those uh, such as Bill Browder, who really pushed Magnitsky sanctions around the world. And it is really uh, a, a great new landscape for human rights uh, and they should be used. The uh, impunity I'm talking about is the fact there are no consequences or no proper consequences for those who commit the most terrible offences around the world. Uh, but the sanction regimes look at addressing that to some extent. As lawyers, we can often look at these legal situations in formalistic, unemotive manner, but it will really bring it back to you today uh, when you hear from people personally affected by the intense repression of the regime uh, in Bahrain. So I, I think that's very important to remember. My experience using sanctions laws against repressive regimes includes a recent submission uh, using the UK's version of the Magnitsky sanctions, uh, which is the uh, Global Human Rights Sanctions Regulations, very close in name to the EU uh, version. There are some minor differences, which I, I might mention when I speak to you about sanctions, uh, but in, in those submissions, which in the end were about 500 pages uh, with evidence, uh, we submitted uh, that members of uh, the Turkish uh, establishment were responsible uh, for the repression of lawyers, torture of lawyers just for carrying out their jobs, minority ethnic groups in Turkey, and uh, as well as uh, torture to death of, a, of an individual they thought was part of an opposition uh, political belief. So this shows you how important these Magnitsky sanctions can be uh, in places where there, there isn't any real rule of law, where you can't go to the courts and complain about being tortured if you're taken to a police station. And the same really applies to the Bahrain situation. Bahrain, unfortunately, is not a place where the local procedures are durable enough to address torture, extrajudicial killings through the court system. And in fact, the court system is often used there uh, as a form of, of oppression of the local people. So uh, the people there don't have the courts to turn to uh, as, as we do. The EU uh, global human rights sanctions regime the Magnitsky Act uh, has passed through the Council of Europe uh, and by council regulation. The objectives uh, of the, uh, of the uh, foreign policy of the EU are set out in Article 21.2 of the Treaty of the European Union. Uh, and it's quite interesting, I'll, I'll read it to you. It's, it states, in relation to the wider world, the Union shall uphold and promote its values and interests and contribute to the protection of its citizens. It shall contribute to peace, security, the sustainable development of the earth, solidarity, mutual respect among peoples, free and fair trade, eradication of property, of poverty, and the protection of human rights, in particular the rights of child, as well as strict observance and development of international law, including respect for the principles of the United Nations Charter. So it's very strong words in the Treaty of the European Union there about what the foreign policy objectives are. And we say when, uh, when it comes down to uh, lobbying and pushing forward uh, our project in regards to sanctioning individuals in Bahrain, that they fit right within the definition of what the EU's foreign policy is supposed to be all about. How does it work? I'm going to give you a very short version. Uh, there's a very interesting chart you can find of the exact processes of sanctions moving through the EU system. I say it's very interesting. It's very interesting for me. It might not be so interesting for all of you to look at. But in line with Article 5 of the Council uh, decision slash regulation that I mentioned implementing the Magnitsky sanctions at an EU level, the High Representative of the EU for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, and 
EU member states have the power to put forward proposals for listings. There's already a number of listings. So if you're interested in those, go and have a look at them. Uh, they're very broad. The, uh, those listed under both the EU sanctions regime and the UK one as well, they have been quite far reaching across the globe, uh, which is good. They're not without, of course, some political considerations at times, but I think it is, uh, we, we should be pleased with the fact that these regimes look to have been used, not just to focus at one particular region of the world. It's then for the EU Council to decide on those listings. Once they're put forward by EU member state, we'll be considering which EU member state to approach uh, to put forward sanctions of individuals in uh, Bahrain. One of the beauties of uh, putting forward individual names is that states may feel more able to do that rather than criticizing a whole state. Uh, so that's one of the one of the benefits of the individual sanctions regime rather than looking at a, a whole state sanction. Anahita, uh, she briefly touched on what we're looking for. What the EU uh, looks for is evidence of qualifying abuses to be raised. Uh, these are torture, uh, other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment, of course, extrajudicial summary or arbitrary executions or killings, enforced disappearance, arbitrary arrests and detentions, and uh, violations and abuses of freedom of expression, opinion, peaceful assembly and association. That's, uh, that's quite a bit wider than the UK sanction regime, which just looks at the right to life, the right to be free from torture, and right to be free from slavery. So the EU uh, regi uh, sanctions regime is broader there, uh, which is good, because I think things like enforced disappearances, although you can try to pigeonhole them into, in, into uh, torture or degrading treatment, uh, they fit better under their own category. And I think that's very important. So I think the broadness of the regime under the, under, under the EU is something to be welcomed. What do they actually uh, do? Well, they create legal obligations for EU um, operators for any business conducted within the EU. So uh, the travel bans on individuals who have perpetrated the abuses apply across the EU. Article 2. Uh, states this member states shall take the appropriate measures necessary to prevent the entry into or transit through their territories of any persons who are responsible for the acts and these are the acts of those human rights abuses that i've set out to you and those who provide financial technical or material support for uh, those such persons so the travel ban is quite an important one and you shouldn't underestimate the power of that because individuals want to become be able to come to europe they want to be able to uh, send their uh, children to European colleges, European schools, uni European universities, they want to be able to go shopping in Paris. So it is an important thing. And, and I don't think we should underestimate uh, the power of that as a symbolic act as well. There is also the freezing of funds under Article 3, the freezing of funds of individuals and entities who've committed abuses, or those who've supported or been involved with the abuses. So it states all funds and economic resources belonging to, owned, held or controlled by a natural or legal person involved in these abuses, once again, uh, and those who provide financial, technical or material support. So in regards to uh, funds, they're quite wide reaching sanctions as well. The, uh, the, uh, the, those are the two main points in regards to the effect of sanctions uh, and the sanctions we'll be looking for. With evidence, it's very important to have a broad base of evidence, and that does exist for Bahrain. There are fantastic organizations collecting evidence, individuals, scholars, of course, uh, as well. So uh, we do have the evidence, and we've, um, we, we have started to have a look at that evidence. The European Centre for Democracy and Human Rights should be congratulated for their fantastic work compiling evidence over, uh, over the years in regards to what's going on. So uh, we, we do think there is evidence in regards to those particular human rights abuses we're looking at. One, one more difference between the UK and EU regime, and I, I realize I've been speaking for a long time, so I'll, I'll give up the floor in just one moment, is that the evidence we use uh, needs to be public evidence rather than anonymous evidence, which can be put forward in the UK regime. And that's just a difference in regards to how the courts of the European Union operate and the courts of the UK operate in that in the uh, in the UK we have um, in camera hearings where people can be excluded from court when 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 evidence is heard. So uh, in regards in regards to uh, just summing up uh, quickly, we hope this project can help to address the impunity which uh, which abusers of human rights have enjoyed for too long in Bahrain. And I say that in the United Kingdom, 
It's embarrassing the fact that our government has allowed the Bahraini regime to behave as, uh, how they have for many years, uh, and the EU really should step up as well. Magnitsky sanctions can have a real practical effect in regards to marking out um, what we believe in and constraining uh, the, the actions of those human rights abusers. Professor Frances Francesco Gemelli says that the EU uh, sanctions regimes has three foreign policy objectives. And I like the way he puts it. He says coercive, constraining and signaling. And it really does send out a strong signal about what the EU um, believes in to stop uh, these kind of people from doing business and traveling freely uh, throughout Europe. I'll leave you with one kind of example of the effects that sanctions can have. And it's a brilliant story um, because it, it really shows that they do have some, some effect. Uh, and that's in regards to Carrie, Carrie Lam in Hong Kong, the chief executive of Hong Kong. She, um, she was complaining to the media about having to carry around big bags of cash because she could no longer use the banking system, even in Hong Kong. Uh, so it shows that uh, the sanctions regimes do have a reach and do uh, inconvenience people who carry out broad human rights abuses around the world. I'm happy to take any questions at the end. If anyone has any questions, I'm not sure if that's part of our schedule, but uh, thank you very much and we look forward to your support in this project. Thank you, Michael, for your very insightful intervention. Uh, as we can see, passing the EU human rights sanctions is a complex process and it requires the unanimous vote of all EU member states. However, it is important now more than ever to hold perpetrators and abusers of human rights accountable. In fact, our next speaker, Ali Mushaima, the son of the jail Bahraini leader of the political opposition, Hassan Mushaima, will remind us why it is important to seek legal actions against these perpetrators. He will share with us his personal experience of torture in Bahrain, as well as the continuous medical negligence and abuse that his father is subjected to. Today, 10 years later, his father remains detained in jail prison and a victim of this culture of impunity. Ali, the floor is yours. Thank you, Basma. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Maybe it's evening for somebody like uh, our friend Marx. Uh, I would like to talk about the moral aspect of the double standards in Western governments and our struggle for justice. In theory, most Western governments have introduced complex laws uh, with the with goal to protect human beings by preserving their dignity and encouraging their development uh, in a way that serves humanity. Long ago, after a lot of struggle, the West tried itself of the era of dictatorships and revived a democratic system. In addition to the recent passing of the Magnitsky, Magnitsky uh, Act, uh, domestic laws and legislation have been enacted in a number of democratic states, as well as at the international level, such as the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. From the ICCPR, we derived laws to protect human rights. This beautiful picture fits the Egyptian uh, proverb. I hear, I hear your words, I believe you, I take a look at your action and wonder. At the international level, all of these laws do not actually apply to the real criminals, the world's leaders who commit crimes when economic or political interests are of bigger interest than the preservation of morality. Netanyahu is involved and responsible in killing more than 60 children during the during 11 days of aggression on Gaza, and more than that number during the war he launched on Palestine previously. But he is a friend and ally who has the right to do anything and everything with full impunity. Hamad bin Salman is responsible for the starvation of millions of Yemenis, the demolition of their homes, the destruction of their infrastructure, and the occupation of their lands. However, he controlled large oil, fills any base generously to the West and buys weapons so he can act as he wants. Of course, there are many more examples. And if 
if we look at the experience of the vulnerable peoples with the with the, this approach, you will find that the laws do not take a silent stand, stand against the war criminals, but they spread their swords against the fighters for the real criminals. For example, the renowned freedom fighter Nelson Mandela was included on the US and the British terrorist list until 2008. And his name was not removed until, until after he won the Nobel Peace Prize and become considered a world champion in fight against racism. After the will of the struggle prevailed uh, in South Africa, a huge body of Nelson Mandela was hanged in front of the British Parliament, and his words were adopted into international legislation like Mandela rules for the minimum standard treatment of uh, prisoners. This is a result of the fact that the West, which has which has update, update laws with, reg, with, reg, with regards to foreign policies towards human rights, in fact, trembles on them in the face of narrow political and economic interests. But at the same time, the West lauds the achievements of the her heroic champions uh, of human rights like Nelson Mandela. So I would say here that the Magnitsky Act is another test of how serious Western governments are about respecting the laws. I believe that Bahrain can provide the simplest test of the co commitment. The crime of torture are clear in Bahrain and the demands to apply these laws to Bahraini officials were issued by victims of torture, international organizations, and even members of the British parliament. But unfortunately, the British government still stand by its bias in favor of the Al Khalifa regime. The British Home Office Minister, Briti Patel, has received over a week ago the Bahraini Minister of Interior, Rashid Al Khalifa, who is responsible for systematic ongoing torture. Dozens of political opponents were killed under his administration, some under methods of torture and others while peacefully demonstrating. Violations in prison are still ongoing and this crime have been documented by many organizations, some of which have received extensive media coverage. I speak to you today as a victim of torture. My 73 years old father is a prisoner of conscience who has spent more than 10 years in prison facing an unfair life sentence uh, and a denial of the necessary health care, a systematic policy against all prisoners of conscience in Bahrain. Last week, political prisoner Hussein Baraka died due to negligent health care as he continued to suffer from the coronavirus that spread among prisoners through prison guards. Hussein and his cell, uh, cell inmate were calling for medical care and he was stating, I can't breathe, please help me. But the authorities ignored his conditions for days and refused to trans transfer him to the hospital until his conditions become worse and impossible to save him. In the end, he became a martyr and another witnesses to the hor horrible injustice in Bahrain prisons. Besides Hussein, the prisoners are still bleeding with the international community to save them from the hell of the prison where they are subjected to the most horrible violations for most of which is the denial of medical treatment. In conclusion, we have talked enough. We must stop this empty slogan and words and instead see the real action that restored hope to the victims. I salute here all the freedom and justice activists, MBs, international organizations, activists and journalists who are doing a wonderful job of making the voices of victims heard. I am hoping efforts which are led by the excellent international lawyers who are part of uh, this panel are successful. And Western governments 
uh, interest does not stand in the way of seeking universal justice to victims of human rights violations in Bahrain and around the world. I repeat, to, uh, I repeat here and call uh, with you and with the people of Bahrain, prisoners of conscience must be released unconditionally. Conditionally, those involved in torture and extrajudicial killing must be prosecuted. The culture of immunity must end. We have to have democracies and get rid of the tyranny. In the end, generations will remember who stood in support of people and who stood in defense of dictatorship. We will continue our moral battle until justice is won. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali, for your intervention. Uh, also, uh, I think it's important to mention that Hassan Mushaima is currently in grave health conditions and authorities uh, continue to deny him the appropriate medical care. Uh, ACGR has launched a website advocating for his release and we call on our audience today to take a look and take action. So the link is now in the chat box. Um, uh, while Ali Mushaima shared with us examples of Bahraini perpetrators who are responsible for systematic torture and other cruel, inhuman, degrading treatment, highlighted cases of political prisoners, what it means to be a Bahraini human rights defender and the abuse you tend to receive when exercising your freedom of speech. Our next speaker, Mark Owen Jones, an assistant professor in Middle East Studies and Digital Humanities at Hamad Ibn Khalifa University, and the author of this fantastic book, Political Repression in Bahrain, will offer a political analysis of the repression that still happens in the Kingdom of Bahrain. Again, reminding our audience why it's so of utmost importance now more than ever to seek sanctions against these perpetrators. Mark, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Alina, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, it's great to be here with, with colleagues and friends and so many brave uh, human rights defenders. Um, so as Alina said, um, I wanna just talk very briefly about uh, political oppression in Bahrain, um, why it's such a big problem, why it's getting worse, and why impunity is one of the fundamental reasons it continues to happen in Bahrain. So I just wanna set the scene for, for for those who are less familiar, political oppression in Bahrain is not a new thing. And that's important to remember. This is something that uh, I have documented personally over the past 100 years. And we've seen it uh, in various stages, almost every decade there's bouts of unrest, um, uh, you know, going back to the 1920s to the current stage. Uh, what's crucial to remember here, if we want to try and quantify political oppression, there's different aspects of it, but for the sake of argument, I'll focus on some of the most egregious types such as uh, torture, uh, extrajudicial killing, etc. Uh, you know, prisoners of conscience. If you want to quantify this, this has got worse over the past eight years. To put that in perspective, uh, 51 people were killed by the government, or uh, most likely killed by the government in 2011. Uh, more, more people were killed then in 2011 than were killed between 1954 and 2010, right? And you know, every year since 2011, uh, a, a large number of people are, have been killed. But what's crucial to remember is from 2011, we're seeing a worsening of political oppression in Bahrain. And one of the reasons for this is that the autocratic regime of Bahrain that's unelected has been able to uh, prosecute these kind of violations going back decades uh, with no accountability. And in actual full view of, of, of uh, certainly British officials. So British officials have known uh, and in some cases been complicit in this kind of uh, these human rights violations uh, since the 50s. However, we know, for example, after the 1970s that British officials at times even hid some of these violations uh, from British MPs in order to, in order to um, maintain their influence over Bahraini officials. Now, the British argument and, and to an extent other European arguments has always been, well, we don't wanna to be too hard on the Bahraini authorities because our good relationship with them enables us to uh, you know, have some influence, right? And it's better to have some influence and try to influence them in a positive way than have no influence at all, which would happen if we came on the, down them on hard, right? That argument historically has not been true. And the way we can quantify that again, 
like I said, is that human rights violations are getting worse. And we know that uh, explicitly no one has been held accountable, really, uh, for Bahrain, uh, in Bahrain for acts of torture and, and uh, extrajudicial killing since uh, it's it first recorded, uh, you know, it's first documented happened. I mean, there's certain mechanisms that have taken place. In 2001, there was a general amnesty for anyone accused of these crimes, General Decree 56, basically exonerated anyone accused of torture. Whilst we saw the BIC report in 2011, we saw that instigate a number of prosecutions against low-level, low-hanging fruit uh, police officers. Many of these police officers were further exonerated or had their charges dropped to manslaughter, right? So the regime has all these mechanisms in place to use the judicial system to exonerate even the low-level officers accused of these killings. The problem is, is we know historically that personality matters at the very highest level. It is these unelected autocratic officials who wield a great deal of influence over personal affairs. We know until recently, until his death, for example, Prime Minister Salman bin Khalifa, he is documented in, 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 in a correspondence between the, uh, the British Embassy in Bahrain and the Foreign Office of being personally responsible, for example, for mass arresting innocent Bahrainis and having them deported to Iran in the early 80s, right? This is well documented. So we know individuals matter. And as a consequence, if the Bahraini judicial system is incapable of holding individuals, especially high level individuals accountable, which it is because the legal system that serves to actually protect that family from prosecution, then the only recourse, or at least one of the best recourses we have is to try and use things like the EU uh, Magnitsky Act or the UK one to actually put pressure and offer some form of accountability on these individuals who, let's face it, are very embedded in the Northern European, North American system, whether it's, as I think Michael said, sending their kids to school there uh, or shopping there or having property there. There's all sorts of things in place that allow this. Um, and crucially, what this would allow um, beyond you know, this individual pressure is it then removes the ability of the Bahraini regime to constantly whitewash its image in Western media. We see it constantly. And we know, for example, and I document it in, in my book, how much the Bahraini government and other autocratic governments spend on PR, on, on you know, uh, having their kind of justifying their actions in the name of, you know, containing, in this case, Iranian uh, uh, expansionism or fighting terror. And we know this is not true. And so when, if, you know, if and when these uh, sanctions occur, Reports on Bahrain will be, or reporters on Bahrain will be obligated, really, professionally, to, to state that many of these high-level officials are actually the, the 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 target of sanctions for the, for their role in human rights abuses. So it becomes harder then for the Bahraini government to constantly use the Western media uh, to try and portray itself as a progressive and liberated regime. And this is really important. Uh, it's, it's actually, you know, democracy is one of the ways we can at least try to bring accountability here is to start to convince the public in those countries to put pressure on their own government to, to enact further sanctions or further um, pressure on, on the Bahrain government. And, and the way to do that, or at least part of the way to do that, is to actually give people the real and accurate image of what's going on in those countries in terms of human rights abuses. Um, uh, these sanctions will be effective. Uh, certainly, we know the Bahrain regime is very much embedded in Europe. I mean, it's a former British, uh, let's not go into Britain and Europe right now, but uh, it's a former uh, protectorate of the uh, UK. But certainly, um, there was always a running joke, and again, that, you know, if things got too heavy in Bahrain, the Emir would flee to Europe. Um, so we, we know that it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a very important place for the Bahraini regime. And we know that uh, failure or the inability to access the resources that Europe offers would be a huge blow uh, to, to, to those targeted. And... Uh, would be effective. And crucially, it's one of the best mechanisms and one of the only mechanisms we have for accountability for Bahraini officials, accountability that has not been forthcoming over 80 years plus of political repression. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark, for this political and historical analysis which adds and strengthens Ali Mushaima's own personal testimony of the culture of impunity in Bahrain. And uh, now we would like to open up the floor to our audience to ask any questions or clarifications they wish to raise. This is also an opportunity for members of the parliament as well as other key stakeholders present today to make interventions if they wish to do so.
So we have the first question and it's to Mark. Uh, what kind of reactions can we expect from Bahraini leaders if such sanctions are imposed do you think they could have a similar reaction as China and impose sanctions on our leaders? Uh, yes, it's a good question. I think, um, firstly, the, the Bahraini leadership would, they wouldn't do much publicly because they would hope that uh, a process of behind the scenes diplomacy would yield uh, fruitful results. So they would keep their power to dry. However, what is very common in the Gulf is just to play off the the, um, the, the US and the UK against countries like China. So Bahrain would probably threaten to move closer to China and Russia uh, in order to to, to scare basically the, the UK, Europe and the US and that it was uh, less likely to be a strategic partner. So that's the reaction I'd expect to see. Whether they put sanctions on uh, British officials, I, I doubt it, or U European officials, I doubt it. Uh, they might insult them in the media. Uh, actually, they definitely would insult them in the local media, <laughs> but uh, they would keep their powder dry until these sanctions seemed like they were um, something that were there to, to, for, the, for the long the durée, as it were. Thank you very much, Mark. So we have the second question, and it's to Mark and Anahita. Why choose you sanctions uh, and not other international mechanisms? Anahita, you can start, maybe. Michael, do you want to take this or? I'm, I'm happy for you to go ahead, go for it. Lovely. Uh, so there are other international law mechanisms, of course. Uh, and we, we've gone through some of the other sanctions regimes processes that are available. And there are also other international mechanisms, for example, make, sending various communications to different UN bodies, uh, Michael's touched on various universal jurisdiction prosecutions and so on and so forth. Uh, we thought that this is a new tool um, under this new regime. And as, as Michael said, it touches on uh, the, it's easy to target people, uh, not just governments or industries on a wide scale. Um, the effects of it could therefore be more targeted and more practical. Uh, so in, in terms of its enforcement, it would have a tangible effect. It wouldn't just be limited at uh, an, an opinion from an international body that may have a limited binding effect. This would curtail the, uh, the target's ability to travel. It would curtail their ability to, um, ex to use their money in the EU. And so it, it would provide that degree of uh, protection, I suppose, against their commission of further offences, and it would deter other officials because it would show that if you continue or if you get involved in these abuses, you're going to have a tangible, um, there's going to be a tangible consequence as a result. And it's not just going to be in writing, it's very much going to affect your life. So that's sort of the practical reason um, why this new tool could be useful. But Perhaps Michael can offer a separate thought on that. I think the 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 answer to that was perfectly given by Anahita. There are, there are lots of different um, measures and tools to use in the EU um, regime. Is one which we think should be used. And I, I you know, the, the, there are some other questions coming through about uh, whether the UK sanctions regime would ever work um, because of the UK government's close relationship with the uh, Bahraini regime and. Uh, that, that's a good point as well. But I think it doesn't stop you from, from trying. And I always say with international mechanisms for justice and human rights is that you should make people put their heads up and say, well, we're, we're, we're standing up for the abusers and make them do it publicly. So um, if they're going to do that, let's, let's make them do that. But I think the EU, um, the EU sanctions regime is a good place to start. Uh, we think uh, that we can put together very strong submissions to an EU state to take sanctions forward, uh, and we're confident of doing that. So uh, we hope that you will support it. We hope you'll write about it and sh share the word about what we're doing with this project as well. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Nahita. And um, maybe I'll read a question to Ali since he uh, hasn't answered any. So there's uh, one which asks, do you think having such sanctions is a good thing? Would you say that activists in Bahrain would like to see um, these type of sanctions in place? 
of course, as I mentioned, we uh, well successful, and uh, we don't we don't have much choice. Uh, I think I think we can we have to work and we, uh, we have and we have to work hard. And uh, I think I think by by working, the, if there is difference between the UK and, and EU, maybe there is some hope. But uh, we can see the result here. Yeah. Thank you, Ali. The connection was quite bad. I think I don't know if it was just me, but we missed the majority of the of your answer. Um, I'll go to the to the next question. So uh, this one is not aimed at anyone particularly. So if you would like to answer it, just go ahead. Uh, the EU and UK have always been aware of the severe human rights violations in Bahrain. What would push them now to take such a decisive action against Bahrain authorities? As Mark stated, the UK, for example, has always adopted the stance that it is safer and more strategic to approach Bahrain in a milder manner. Uh, in regards to the way the EU regime operates compared to the UK um, UK one, what you need is you need strong uh, support from uh, from European countries. So you need a European country to put it forward. So that's what we're working on, uh, political lobbying around that, which also helps generally with the cause of countering repression in Bahrain, uh, raising the issue, making sure uh, that uh, politicians throughout the European U Union know that it's an important thing to 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 look into so uh, that's what we'll we will be focusing on in in the uk uh, sanctions regime regulation it's the foreign uh, and commonwealth office which makes the decision about sanctioning individuals and to be fair to them so far if you look at the list it is a very broad range of uh, of countries including some countries uh, which are generally seen as allies of the United Kingdom. So, so um, they have been fairly good so far, but I, I'm not saying that that means that they would um, add uh, individuals from, from Bahrain immediately without some pressure. In regards to whether, whether there would be litigation you can bring if there was an unreasonable decision not to add someone to the list, that's a bit of a difficult question, but it's an open question. In the UK, we haven't had our own sanctions regime um, because it's been done from, for, through the EU for so long. Um, so some of these legal questions are still very exciting, still very interesting to look at about whether you can force um, a sanctions listing, uh, as well as challenges. Of course, you can challenge a listing, so whether you can force a sanctions listing as well. So uh, the answer to that is really the EU, um, the EU regime for sanctions relies on strong political pressure. And that's where people who are watching this really come in. So writing to your European Parliament members, your local uh, parliamentary members as well, and raising this issue. So uh, there's, we, we do need your help. Well, I just add as well, I mean, there's um, so many attendant benefits to launching these actions. I mean, first of all, autocratic governments now uh, are aware that this is a possible consequence for them violating human rights, and this is not the publicity they want. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, this is uh, even the, the publicity such a uh, bringing this case will, will kind of bring it will it will actually uh, add public pressure, but also pressure on, on the Bahraini regime to actually make them consider the actions more. As I said before, and as has been said by everyone here, impunity uh, allows people to engage in forms of repression they, repression they might not otherwise do. So beyond just the actual potential, if sanctions are actually um, enacted, the process itself should not be underestimated as an effective tool in, in, in attempting to raise public awareness about an issue and also put pr pressure on, on those uh, who are the target of sanctions. Thank you very much, Michael and Mark. So we have one more question. Uh, what do you expect the reaction of Gulf Cooperation Council countries to be should these sanctions be imposed? Anyone can answer. I think, I mean, we know that this, I mean, this, it's, it's interesting. I think if the sanctions were targeted at very high level officials within the ruling core, 
uh, then we'd see uh, angry reactions from the Gulf states. As we know, similar actions were taking place against those involved, those Saudi officials involved in the killing, Jamal Khashoggi. But in, in some ways that was, that was not, that was a strategic asset to Saudi because it meant that they could say, yeah, these people are being held accountable, but it didn't really get to the root of the problem, which was Mohammed bin Salman and his accoutrement. So I think the key to the Gulf countries, the GCC reactions is who is targeted by these. Because if they know that certain people in the ruling core are not off limits, then they'll be worried. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, thank you everyone for your questions and answers. The time is running out, unfortunately, and we'll have to wrap it up with the questions. Uh, now I would like to give the final word to Michael, our leading lawyer in this case, to conclude today's event and to liberate our next step in this legal campaign. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the whole team at the European Centre for Democracy and Human Rights. Uh, thank you to Basma, Manon, Alina. Thank you to the fantastic panel today, Ali, Anahita, uh, and Mark. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming along. We've had um, almost 100 people here. Your voices are very important on this issue. You, you obviously care a lot about it, uh, so please do raise your voices. It's important for the Bahraini people. It's important for our governments to know that we care about these issues and we don't accept that a whole people uh, can be repressed in such a way. So please do support us. Please do write about it. You can write for your newspapers, write online and mention the project uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll move forward with it. So thank you so much for coming along today. Uh, there will be a press release, I believe, um, going out perhaps tomorrow uh, just setting out what we're doing with the project so if you are from the press please do pick it up please circulate it and uh, we hope to see you again we will update you as the project moves forward